Hey everybody, uh, thank you so much for coming out on a Wednesday night, on a very hot Wednesday night at the end of September. But uh, I'm Kevin O'Connell, I am the founder of the Niche Movement. We are based in Washington, D.C., as I was telling a few of you throughout the uh, kind of networking happy hour here tonight. But basically what we, uh, we do is try to help college students and young professionals rethink their career search and, and you know, rethink the traditional way of going out and getting a job and finding a career you love. You, know, you can talk about passion, uh, purpose, things like that, but I really think it's about finding your niche. And uh, we're going to talk about a little bit with that uh, about with Mary here, who works for HBO, who is a good friend and a former student of mine, which I'll get into in a second. But uh, I love this time of year. Um, it was five years ago. I was just telling, where's Holly? I, I think I was just telling Holly. Five years ago, this time I started the niche movement. It was all around sitting around a campfire where a bunch of my friends were complaining about their jobs. I'm sure many of you have been there. And one of my friends was like, "You're trying to help college students find their niche." And literally the next day I went on like domain.com and took out the niche movement.com. Uh, that week I wrote my first blog post, I think it was like skip your career fair and I got a lot of flack from higher education people. And um, now we're 30 contributing editors strong. We're five years in, it, it is still a grassroots organization that's been from DC to Montreal and everywhere in between. Uh, I think Mary, you've been to a few of these, but this is our, I think third New York City fireside chat, our eighth fireside chat in total. And I definitely would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that uh, Mary, uh, working with HBO, has helped facilitate a lot of us through HBO's partnership and sponsorship, so I can't thank you enough. So please give HBO and Mary a round of applause for that. Thanks. And uh, one other reason this is a really happy time for me is next week, October 6th, will be my three-year anniversary that I stomached up the, the, the courage uh, to walk into my boss's office at Rutgers University and say, uh, I'm giving my two-week notice, peace. <laughs> and uh, I've been working for myself doing this in, in a digital storytelling agency uh, full time ever since. And so, uh, without further ado, though, I really want to welcome you, Mary. I met Mary in 2010 or so, or 2009 at Rutgers. Yeah, probably 2009. Yeah. And uh, the cool thing that I, I really uh, kind of get to do tonight is you are my first student that I've actually interviewed in person for the niche movement. And um, I've seen Mary blossom into this awesome young professional. Even we were just joking around. She has two phones. I don't know where they are. Uh, but she's like super important. She's like, I just dealt with something. And so I don't know what that My was. I don't, I don't know who's the, assistant has I don't know if it was <laughs> the uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm uh, premiere tonight. But I, I am very excited to hear what Mary's been up to here in New York City for the last four or five years working for HBO. Uh, but without further ado, what I'd like to do, Mary, and the first question I tend to kind of ask in these events is, do you remember your first job, and if so, what was it? My first job ever was when I was uh, 10 years old, and my two older brothers were uh, referees for the uh, town basketball association. They, would, they also went to Rutgers. They would come down every weekend, ref all day, and I would keep the book and the scoreboard and during every time out and halftime I would play one-on-one -on -one with them trying to up my game. Um, I didn't play for Vivian Stringer, uh, that didn't happen, but they did pay me um, five dollars a day. Um, so that was my first job actually ever, but paycheck wise um, I worked at the beach actually as a badge checker. All right. Uh, well, I mean, you got paid, so you can kind of consider that, that refereeing and bookkeeping oh, yeah. thing, yeah. Um, so let's go back a little bit. So obviously, I know you have five brothers, but where did you grow up? And what, what was that like as a child? And you alluded to the sports side. So where did you grow up, and, and what was childhood like? Uh, I grew up in Toms River, New Jersey, mm -hmm. born and raised. Um, I'm the youngest of five kids. I have three older brothers and an older sister, um, and now I have three sister-in-laws and a brother-in-law. So, um, but growing up in Tom's River, yeah, I came from a sports family. It's a really big baseball town if you're not familiar with it. Um, I played softball, basketball, field hockey. Um, I came in last place in the team run for life and I will never live that down in my family. So that's... <laughs> so just a little bit of competitive family. A little bit. Yes. Okay. A little bit. So uh, was it because your, your brothers and other siblings went to Rutgers that drew you to Rutgers or what... what you know, what made you choose Rutgers University in New Jersey? So it was a little bit of both. Um, two of my older brothers went to Rutgers University and they really, I mean, they, they did the way they talked about college. They were really in love with their experience. Um, I had visited a couple other colleges, smaller colleges, um, but when I visited Rutgers, the size of it, the fact that I needed to take 
a bus to go to another campus, um, I think that would deter other people, but that actually, you know, turned me on to, <laughs> to go to Rutgers and really get to, um, you know, experience diversity and um, adversity and just, just all, all different kinds of challenges. So that's what really turned me on to Rutgers. Did it help that you kind of had the last name Johnson? Like, did you get kind of welcomed into the Rutgers family right away? Um, Legacy-wise, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't... Almost joined like a kind of, you know, pseudo fraternity sorority, right? A, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I feel like the fact that I, it was definitely helpful that I got in Rutgers because of them, but I mean, I did it on my own. You, you did your own thing, clearly. Um, so I remember when we met, I worked in the recreation department and you started out probably as a, as a referee, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Talk a little bit about your four years there and, and maybe what was something that was a super impactful moment, whether that be your job in recreation, your classes, was there something that was an impactful moment at Rutgers? Um, I think a really, I mean, there are a lot of impactful mo moments. I th working for recreation was, um, you know, I think that saved me, that was awesome. Um, I had a sports background, I played sports my entire life and I decided to just stop cold turkey, but then I found recreation and I found a home there. Um, impactful wise, it, it sometimes wasn't easy working as a referee when you're refing, you know, 22 year old men and you're an 18 year old girl and you're telling them that they made a foul and they're getting in your face and you have to stand up to them and say no you did that, come on. Um, that, like, the, that, that, those are moments where really, you don't think about it at the time, but you need to stand your ground, stand up for yourself, and really, um, as, a, as a ref, I really, you, you need to believe in what you're saying in order for everyone else to believe in what you're saying. Like, so if that's a foul, that's a foul. Um, and I think I carry that with me. So when I go into a meeting right now, um, you know, if the TPS reports are due at five, the TPS reports are due at five. You know what I'm saying? So office space reference. Office space reference. Yeah. Just, we don't do TPS reports, I promise. <laughs> so I, I'm glad you just made that kind of full circle connection because that was my follow-up question is did that experience and that, you know, what was the transferable skill there? And clearly you kind of made a connection there. Um, so with, with Rutgers, when was the moment you're like, oh shit, I'm graduating and I need to like figure out life? When I realized that I wasn't living in a crazy party house anymore and I had to move back in with my parents, um, I basically had an oh shit moment. I need, I really need to, um, get organized and get a job and, um, I actually interned with HBO and pestered them, um, basically, but um, I felt a lot of pressure to get a job right out of college, and if I didn't get a job right out of college, what was going to be my next step? I had to have a plan of action. Um, working summer camps and at the beach forever was not, and living in my parents' basement was not an option, um, so grad school was going to be my backup plan. Really? Yeah. So. Um I don't know if, I, didn't, I don't remember that you interned there. How did you get that internship though? How did you get that foot in the door with HBO? So uh, I guess impactful moment number two um, with recreation. Uh, I, in working with recreation, we had a club called the Recreation um, Advisory Council and we put on events and one of the events was a golf outing that I originally chaired, which means you, you help organize and find sponsors and all that good stuff. I chaired it because my brothers were golfing in it and I wanted to hang out with them during the day and be the cool girl whose brothers get to like golf. And I'm like, oh, look at these cool older guys. They'll, they're gonna give me beer. Like, I just thought that was cool. But then it opened my eyes that there were other alumni there and those alumni had careers. And I was a journalism major and I love writing, um, but I was really, really interested in the PR side of things. Um, so I knew through actually Jacqueline Mandelbaum, who also went to Rutgers and now works at HBO, she was a part of the same recreation crew. Um, we met a man named uh, Jeff Hewson. He is an EVP of corporate affairs at HBO. He's an, a Rutgers alumni. And I asked my boss at the time to introduce me because I was really interested in having, I wanted an internship at HBO. Um, so I wanted to meet him and I made sure that I was at 
the, the, I even made sure that the hole placement, like what, whatever hole he was golfing at, was prime placement um, and easy so to meet. Had a so goal, you had a goal in mind though, like you yes. knew who to target. Yes, he was my target. He didn't know that that day, but he was. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to pull something practical out of this. What would you tell somebody in, in your shoes that maybe uh, doesn't have that tenacity or, or doesn't realize what is in front of them, be it a golf outing, a career mm -hmm. fair, uh, a networking event like this tonight? Um, because I feel like so many people are like at an event and, and all of a sudden it's a missed opportunity and they didn't have that game plan in place. And right. I encouraged to ask Paul Fish back, like, put me on that hole, introduce me to that Introduce person. me to him, yeah. Um, I mean, I think every day, honestly, you're given opportunities, whether you decide to make a right on one street or a left on one street. And you can either beat yourself up about missing an opportunity like that and like feeling timid you can you can beat yourself up about it or you can take it as a teachable moment and say okay next time this happens or create create the opportunity in your head before it even happens and prepare yourself and you know you, you got to be a little fearless sometimes and it, it can be uncomfortable having a conversation with an executive who you do not know you you know you don't you have I, he could have he could have said no to me but what what's the worst he could say no so just take each moment or missed opportunity as a teachable moment I think and replay it in your head and say how would I do this differently and then there will be other opportunities absolutely um, so I, we'll start getting into like actually what you do but what, do you remember what that thing was that you said to Jeff or, or the introduction or, or was there a follow because I'm sure like he's not saying oh you got the internship on a oh, golf no, no, course no, no. so what was, the, what was the process or what did you say to him? Um, so when I was introduced um, I, I believe I, I said you know I was super smiley because um, I was also waitressing at Applebee's neighborhood <laughs> bar and grill on the side but a smile goes a long way. Yes. It really does. Doesn't cost um, nobody anything. wants to say yes to somebody who's like, hey, give me an internship. Um, you walk up to somebody and say, hi, you're enthused. He's having a good day. It's sunny out. I said, hi, uh, I'm Mary. You know, I'm a junior. I'm, I'm a journalism major, but I'm super interested in PR and I love HBO. I love HBO. I want to learn as much as I possibly can. Are there any internships available? Summer, fall? you know, winter, spring, I don't care. Um, and I think it was, he, he heard the desperation and confidence in my voice. Um, <laughs> uh, and he said, okay, uh, why don't you send, follow up with my boss who introduced us and then he connected us via email and I didn't leave him alone. I emailed him and said, what do I need to do? And that's and, and then it took it went off from there. All right, so this is getting really good. So you didn't leave him alone. No. I just uh, I think it was two weeks ago. I received seven emails in forty eight hours from one person. Mm -hmm. So did you do that technique, or, or, or how did you have the kind of the smarts <laughs> to be like, you need to advocate for yourself, but also you're not like stalking right. him and being overbearing. Right. So I didn't badger him, um, but I also didn't play my cool. Like I was trying to like date somebody. Like all right, like I'll give him, I'll give him some time. Like no, I was. Persistent enough where, you know, maybe um, I would email him Monday and then if I didn't hear back from him by Friday, I would email him by the end of the day on Friday um, and say, hey, but he was actually very, very responsive. Um, yeah, he brought me in for an interview and then he told me to wait. Um, it was my junior year. He told me to wait till my senior year to intern there in hopes that maybe it would turn into a job. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so, so what do you do now? You, you uh, graduated from Rutgers. How long did you have to live at your parents' house or, or wait for that full-time job offer? So I graduated from Rutgers in May 2012, and I lived at my parents' house um, in the summer of 2012, and was I, my start date was October 1. Um, and so I interviewed in September. So it was kind of like I had a summer vacation, but I didn't know I was having a summer vacation. I was freaking out because- Your last summer vacation. Yeah, the, you know, um, I had a bunch of different jobs during the summer and my parents were asking me, what are you doing? What are you gonna do? You know, you need to start looking for a plan and uh, or figuring your, you know, figuring your life out. And I was politely telling them, I, I am, I don't, I don't want to live here either. So, um, I, I kept in contact with him. Cool. 
Uh, so what do you do? I was gonna, I asked Mary, like, what is your title? How should I describe everybody to yourself? What do you, give your title and then like, what does that actually mean at a day-to-day -day basis? Okay, um, so I am the Associate Manager of Corporate Social Responsibility, which falls under the Corporate Affairs umbrella at HBO. So Corporate Affairs is just um, a way of saying uh, like brand PR, um, corporate PR. So it's not necessarily public relations for the programming, like the shows, but it's public relations for the actual brand. So, um, you know, if, if a story just about HBO breaks, um, the corporate affairs team overall covers that. So, but my particular role in corporate social responsibility is basically, it's corporate philanthropy. Um, we deal with uh, uh, giving back and nonprofits and really trying to tie um, any cause-related campaign into uh, the programming or the brand itself, and then we elevate it through the, uh, the PR umbrella that we are under. So it basically kind of paints HBO into a great spotlight with different communities other than just being known for their you know, right. big series of game and Right, and so like one of uh, the mission of, of my, my subgroup basically is to really um, find a way to integrate community into the brand. So when you think HBO, you think, all right, Game of Thrones, it's awesome, but also, you know, they give a damn about the community. They care about the, the audience who's watching them. Um, and that can range from anything from um, arts and education, healthcare, um, military, veterans, things like that. So I, I think it was like a year ago, last summer, you did a Snapchat guest story takeover for the niche movement. Yes. What were you, do so I, there's two things I want to talk about, what you were doing last summer, and I think you did it again this summer. What was that initiative? So I was, I did a takeover for the American Black Film Festival, which is uh, one of my groups, probably the, our biggest sponsorship. Um, now, when you, I say sponsorship, I mean, the, it's a nonprofit organization, and we will invest uh, money into them, and in depending on what they do, so a film festival, they are basically finding new creative, diverse talent, new filmmakers, um, we also have a, a comedy show, so new comedians, and then we introduce them to our programmers. So our programmers who put, who, who develop shows, they, they develop the content that will eventually be put on HBO. These are for those filmmakers who ordinarily wouldn't have had a chance to meet face to face with these people. So what my group does is we plan the activations depending on the size, how much money um, we spend on the sponsorship. Um, we plan the activations around it. So with that, that one was it's our biggest one. So I showcased our short film competition. Um, so we have five, five finalists, five uh, filmmakers, and we showcase their five short films. Um, it goes through um, uh, a series of, of, of judging from our programmers to people in different departments in legal. And then the filmmakers, what's really cool is that they get to meet with legal and our licensing teams to know, you know, how do I license my music? How do I how do I know that I need to have a contract signed, that I have this location covered? Um, it really, it kind of guides them into creating the best film that they can make. And then we have a winner, and they all, they win a sum of money, because it's not cheap to make a film. And then all of the five finalist films are featured on HBO. And then in addition to that, we have a comedy competition. So we have a stand-up, it's just, it's stand-up, um, and all of this is diverse talent. Um, and they, they pick a winner, and then that stand-up comedian, they get specific meetings with our comedy um, programmers, and they can potentially get a development deal out of it, and a lot of them have been very, very successful with that. Wow. Is there, is there any off the top of your head that people should check out, be it the people in the audience are watching uh, this video? Uh, is there anything on HBO Go or anything that, you, that you've been a part of that's gotten greenlit or has been up there? I mean, all uh, the so the short films. If you if you go on HBO Go or HBO Now, it'll say um, ABFF next to it, ABFF finalist, um, and those are the five final films. Um, and they're short, they're like twenty minutes long, but they're you know short stories. But what's great is that um, the the writers and directors could potentially get a job and signed on to another show that's in development because they really like their writing style or directing style or what have you. Cool. 
And what was the second thing that you, you did with uh, Mental Health Awareness and Chris Gethard? Uh, that was my favorite project by far. Um, so Chris Gethard, if you're not familiar with him, he is a comedian. Um, he's been featured, if you guys watch Broad City, he's Alana's boss uh, last season in Broad City. Um, and he has struggled. I also do comedy, so I feel like I had a soft spot for this. Um, and he, in his, in his uh, program, he really highlights mental health um, and, and depression. And it seems kind of ironic to have a comedy special about depression and suicide. But what he does is he raises awareness and he makes it, um, he makes it a conversation that you're comfortable to talk about. It's OK to talk about this. Don't feel ashamed about it. Um, people aren't ashamed to talk about you know, a sickness they can't help. This is a sickness that people can't help. So what was cool about this was that I was in the room from brainstorm to complete fruition. So we brainstormed um, the idea with um, our on-air team, um, my boss, and um, the programmer involved, and who was directly tied to Chris Gethard. And basically, we wanted to develop a, a digital asset to both promote the, the special and to raise awareness because since i work in csr it's a part of the cause it's cause marketing so we really wanted to integrate that hbo cares about mental health awareness and conveniently enough it uh aired in may which is also mental health awareness month so it kind of it just all bubbled up and it was very cool i you know i got to go on set um, and and work with everybody who worked on set and, and see that get that glimpse of how they develop those those assets and, and the watch the conversation. So he had a conversation one on one, kind of like me and you are having right now, like just comfortable um, with all with diverse comedians of all different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, Wyatt Snack, Phoebe Robinson, uh, Patty Harrison, um, and they talked about their how they dealt with mental health um and so that eventually became um it's on youtube you can look it up it's um it's called a story that's everywhere um and that came out a week before the premiere of the comedy special so it was really cool for me because i don't I don't always get to work on the marketing aspect or the promotional aspect, um, and I don't always get to work on subject matter like any of us. We don't get to work on subject matter we want to work on. So it was mental health, which I also have a soft spot for, um, comedy, and just working with different groups and people that it was, it was amazing to totally see come to fruition. Um, yeah. I remember, I think, when we met up in June, you were, I could see the kind of excitement and enthusiasm, like this was a project, not only you saw it get kind of cross the finish line, but something that you were into, and you got behind the scenes, you got access to Chris Gethard. Mm -hmm. um, and like you just alluded to, not everybody gets to do that, right? You get hired for one job, and it could be a year, it could be six months, it could be five years, you're like, this sucks, this sucks, right. this sucks, but I got something out of it. Um, right. What, what advice, because like obviously you've been at uh, HBO for four and a half, It'll five be years. five years, October 1st. That's cool. So another good uh, anniversary here coming up. Um, what would you tell uh, some, some professionals out there that maybe they, they, so like they got into an HBO or they got into something they really love, but maybe the job or the work they're working on in the short term isn't what it's cracked up to be? Should they wait it out? Should they, you know, should they ask for more? Like, mm -hmm. how do you get your Chris Gethard moment? Um, um, oh, I, would, I hope he's watching this, but I feel like he'll get warm fuzzies all over. Um, I think it's a, it depends on the situation. Um, I think that in order to feel successful, you need to be able to have an open conversation with your boss. Um, if you're not comfortable, I am so lucky. I can walk into my boss's office and, you know, tell her what I didn't like about the meeting we just had. Um, that's happened before. Um, and then how do we change that? So you, I think having that candidness and open conversation, obviously be respectful and professional. Um, and I think it shows something if you walk into their office with, you know, you have a goal in mind. I think that more often than not, people are afraid to do that and their employer doesn't think they're taking the initiative. I think it'll show that you're taking the initiative if, 
you walk in and say, hey, I have this goal in mind. And if they discourage you from that, then they're a shitty boss. <laughs> Sorry. So maybe you need to piece out or, or figure out where else you belong yeah, in the organization. Yeah, I think, I think you, I mean, don't just be like, all right, I'm yeah, out. Yeah. This is yeah. it. Like, I think you yeah. need to make a game Doesn't plan for overnight. yourself. And yeah. I mean, that's like anything. It's like being, if you're in a relationship that you don't yep. like being in, you didn't know you didn't like being in it from the, the start, but you, you take time to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I think you need to develop a game plan and ask yourself, what do I really want? Cool. Uh, so I'm going to ask you two polarizing questions before we get into some other stuff. So what do you like most about HBO? I mean, Or about your, jo about your job. Or about oh, about your my job. job. I'm like yeah, the programming. Yeah, yeah. The show's like the entertainment. Um, about my job, uh, I, what I like about my job is that we're the do-gooders of the company. Like we're always, we always have the halo around our head. We're always looking to do really good. And we get to collaborate with departments across the board. Um, anything in, in this kind of present time that you would change that could make it go from like an eight to a 10 or seven to a nine? Like, I feel like that's a loaded question, Kevin. <laughs> we'll shut the cameras uh, off for this. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's like anything. I mean, I don't think, like I said in the beginning, our goal is to integrate uh, giving back into the brand. I don't think people necessarily, when they do think HBO, yeah. they don't think community yet. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything I would change is to really amplify that. Cool. Any, if there's anybody out there that are, is thinking about, so, so what, what I'm hearing you say is uh, if this, this type of job or this uh, role in, an, in another organization could be really good for somebody that's uh, mission driven, uh, passion driven, or cause driven, right? Yes. Um, what advice would you have to somebody that knows that they need to be tied to a mission? Like, how do they go get a, a corporate social responsibility job at Chase or at Time Warner? Right? And not, like, like what, what are things that you guys hire for or look for? Or, well, I mean, I, I have actually I have people that are interested in CSR and giving back all the time. I actually have them um, because a couple people couldn't make it this week, but they emailed me separately and said, Hey, I'm really interested in CSR. Do you want to get a cup of coffee? Um, I have people in HBO ask, like, getting coffee, asking me, what can I do um, on my own end? And m if they want a career in that, I think a lot of people want a career in CSR. I think it's a really desirable job. And I don't think people realize I mean, I didn't realize this was an actual job when I was in college that I could do this for an entertainment company like HBO. Um, you know, I didn't realize that. So then it, it, they want to give back as best they can, but then they find themselves in a role. So you can always work, work with a nonprofit um, and there's nonprofits that like the niche, like, right? Like the niche movement. Yeah, like, we're not technically nonprofit, not profit, but, but, yeah, but, um, but you work for an organization back, that yeah. like has a focus though in what you want to do. So mm -hmm. if I'm really interested in animals, I'm going to go volunteer at an animal shelter. <laughs> yeah. um, and maybe that I'll meet people, you know, there might be an executive having a volunteer day for Chase and mm -hmm. I'm, I happen to be volunteering that day and I have a, a great conversation with them and they have an opening on their team for whatever reason, you know? Um, I think you need to put yourself in the place you want to be. It's going back to the golf course analogy, like put yourself in situations that you potentially can ask a question right. and get a yes to. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's a great transition. You just said like, you know, volunteering, things like that. I'm a big believer in the in boutique career. Like you don't have to make a living in a nine to five world anymore. It could be gig economy. Yeah. We've all heard these terms. What do you do outside of your nine to five at HBO? Um, so outside of me being corporate Johnson, I, <laughs> I love to do, I'm a really big goofball. I love comedy, as I said, with Chris Gethard, but I love writing sketch comedy. My dream job uh, would be to be on SNL, uh, Saturday Night Live, um, or just be a writer on Saturday Night Live, write my own sketch sketches. Um, I do improv at the, the People's Improv Theater, and I am going to start doing stand-up, just take classes in stand-up. Um, in October at the People's Improv Theater. Um, and improv is that you don't need to do that just if you think you're funny. I think everybody should take improv. It's super therapeutic and it allows you to just completely get out of your element if you're having like a rough day. It's great. I'm a big believer. Uh, 
one of the meetings I had at, at GW where I adjunct, uh, they, we talked about like doing improv, like whether it's in the classroom, I, th I think it's a big professional skill set. Like I would highly recommend what you just said, like take an improv class, it makes you think on your feet, mm -hmm. whether it's in, in, your, in a meeting with your boss or something like this. Uh -huh. uh, I think it's super as, helpful. As weird as it is, it, it, it puts you in a really uncomfortable situation. Like you don't always, you don't want to like, not know what to say and have to react or do a weird exercise in someone's face but then it it allows you to let go um and kind of put that discomfort behind you um and just embrace the moment and sometimes i've found it useful when i'm put on the spot in a meeting and i have no idea what to say but i kind of pull something you know like you did three questions ago yeah pretty yeah. much yes exactly so what, what was the itch where you were like, because I think a lot of people sit at home and are like, they have a job, they're paying the bills, but like, there is more things that they want to do with their life. Mm -hmm. But then they're like, they don't want to take that improv class, they don't want to go volunteer, they don't want to, uh, you know, whatever, add a skill to their resume. What, what was the moment where you're like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, because I know you do some sketch stuff on the side, mm -hmm. you have a little YouTube series. What was that moment where you're like, I'm actually going to take action on this? So... It's, I never even thought about doing improv. I, I felt like I was missing a little bit of something and I decided to, I, I play softball for the HBO team. Happened to meet a guy who was a camera guy, does improv on the side and I was telling him about, it's like I really, I always want to be on SNL and like I, I want to, you know, perform and get and like be quirky and be in front of people. He's like, you should, you should do improv. And I was like, well, what do you mean? I, like, I never even thought of it. and. Again, I like happened to just be in a situation where we had that conversation and it took me it took me some time and I did some research and I found, you know, improv level one class and I, I just I went I just I took it. Um, if if you don't know what you're into, um, then I would just say put some headphones on and figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people might think um you were in the right place, right time, or, or it was a little luck, or it was a little, and, and I also think it was some tenacity in your personality. Where do you think? Is it the luck side, right place, right time, actually having the skill set to, to get that opportunity, or? I think it's a, it's a, you know, formula of all of that. Um, you know, just as much as you have lucky situations, you have unlucky situations, and it's a matter of whether you're dwelling on, like, oh, why does this always happen to me? Like, this sucks. But instead, you didn't realize you were, you know, sitting next to the cute guy on the train that, like, you're reading the same book as. And you're like, oh, okay, like, maybe we can, like, have a moment, you know? But, like, that, but you don't even think about that. Instead, you're dwelling on your unlucky. Um, but, and then you need to, I think, being aggressive to a point is important. Yeah. And being confident is important. Um, what would you tell somebody that um, might be in an unlucky situation or... How, can, how do you get more opportunities like you've been fortunate to have? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I mean, go out, don't sit at home. Don't sit at home and feel sorry for yourself. Go out with your friends. And don't even, don't think about, I think opportunities arrive when you're, it's so cliche, when you're least expecting them. Um, <laughs> but, when you're like out with your friends, not thinking about it, and you're in your happy element, something great happens. I think the the energy you put out is the energy that you receive. Mm -hmm. Hundred um, percent. I have three kind of short questions for you, and mm -hmm. so we'll turn over to Q and A for you guys in the audience. Um, I think you mentioned maybe it might have been in college or the time between getting a full time job offer at HBO. What is, what has been a moment of kind of adversity in your professional career? Because right now, you know, a lot of people watching or sitting here might be like, well, she had the lucky break on the golf course, the lucky yeah. break here, there, there. Um, it's all rainbows and butterflies for Mary. But like, what, what has been some adversity along the way? Or, or where do you hope to, because you might, no, you, I mean, you want to get to other places. It was, there, I mean, I, I faced challenges. I was not looking to get into CSR and corporate social responsibility. It, I was, I was a coordinator, the same role for four years. Um, and a lot of the times the textbook, they say stay at your job for two years and then turn over. But you know, I still had more to learn. And um, it, sometimes it feels like you're walking in place. 
especially in a corporate structure and there's a hierarchy um, and you can you can really be discouraged because you feel you feel like there's something you're supposed to be doing or there's supposed to be this plan um, and sometimes you know you get lost in that like similar like oh why me like type thing like it's human like I feel those I feel I don't Sometimes I'm like, ugh, like I don't have, I'm not focusing enough on my side, like improv and all that good stuff, because that's what I really love to do. But then also, like, I should have taken the initiative in that meeting and and like done this, and I maybe I would have like shown off. Um, so it's, I mean, it's not always rainbows and butterflies. I think that you just need to, I don't know, bite down and deal sometimes. Gotta be an adult sometimes. Just suck yeah, it up. you just yeah. yeah, suck it up. What's been, um, I'll give you op two options here. What's been either the best piece of career advice you've been given or the person that's impacted your life the most? And if you want to answer both, go for it. Um, I don't think I, I don't think I have one answer for either. I don't, I don't have one person who's impacted me. I think every important person in my life, um, which I'm lucky I have a very big family and I have really great friends, um, have all impacted me in a positive way. Um, career advice, um, I would say that it's funny because um, I hope my parents or my dad is not watching this, um, but I feel like he's he can get negative, but his advice to me was don't, if somebody asks you something in a meeting or, or asks you something in, in the workplace, don't say no right off the bat. Don't say no, um, which is kind of coincides with improv because you yes and. Um, but nobody wants to work with somebody who says no. Um, and I guess that was retrospective. He said that my mom, um, she tells me to stop saying like all the time, which is really helpful. And I find that when I don't know what to say, I'm like, I don't know what to say. Um, I know you. You're you used to do that in college. I think a, a little a bit. Lot? Yeah, oh, a lot. A little bit. Not, not not a lot, but like it's <laughs> like now you mention that very, this whole interview very well spoken. Oh, thanks. Yes. Thanks. I hope she's watching. <laughs> Compliment to Mrs. Johnson. Um, what would you tell? This is probably the last question. What would you tell your college senior self? You just graduated. What would you tell Mary Johnson of 2012? I would tell Mary Johnson of 2012 to not fret for that last summer vacation and to live it up because you're going to get a job in October. Um. Is that when we played on the softball team uh, and recreation or was that the year before? It was the year before. It was the year before when I worked at summer camp. Um, that was like a real summer. Um, no, but seriously, I guess what I would tell myself would be stay positive. Don't worry about it. Stay positive. It's going to be okay. The world is going to keep spinning and it's going to be okay. Great. Um, I was really excited to sit down with you, Mary. Please get up for Mary Johnson. A round of applause. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you all for being here. What I'd like to do, we always do this for at least 5, 10, 15 minutes. And again, we're not getting out of here anytime soon. So if you want to connect with Mary, you're more than welcome to. But what, you got to have some questions for Mary, some itching questions, whether it's about HBO, her job, or corporate social responsibility. Holly. Uh, I just had a quick question. You mentioned military like involvement that HBO does in the military or mm -hmm. service men and women. Can you elaborate on what you guys do with that? Yeah, so I mean we'll we will sponsor veteran organizations from a fundraising standpoint, like if they have an event to we've supported um, the Veterans Day Parade with uh, Float and have a military employee resource group. Um, it's called HBO Salute and we will uh, give them opportunities to participate in nonprofit events. Um, additionally, we ho we, HBO has a, a theater space, so we will host um, events for, for veterans and nonprofits, um, in addition to promoting programming like Band of Brothers and the Pacific and things like that around those days. Um, I think that relates to the, I think that relates to my response with like sometimes I, you know, you do feel 
like a little like there is no plan. Um, I wish there was a plan. Um, if the you know the SNL team decided to sign me on as a writer, um, love HBO, but deuces. Um, but I mean, I think that now that I've worked in CSR for so long, it will always be innate in me in whatever role I do take. Who else would like to ask Mary a question? <laughs> what would, if in a perfect world and you had all the power, what would you do to your job to make it better or completely like tailored to you? Like what, what would you change about it if you had the ability? If I had the, all the power in the world. Well, you have to keep your current job, but you can change it to what's in you. Totally. If I had my current job, and all the power in the world, I would also hire me as a writer and a star of a new HBO series that is completely, uh, that is funny, um, but that also I would have a star-studded cast and I would have them completely give themselves to my group in every ask, um, whether it is the, like whatever. So in terms of their passion, so say like Wolf Ferrell was in my, in my make-believe series that I am writing and we're also working in CSR. Um, I would give him an opportunity and a platform to also push forward in what initiative he wants to do because each and every person I think has a passion. Um, like I said, like I love animals. Like I would probably help all the animals in the world because they're cute. Um, but I would give everybody opportunity to give back and all the money. <laughs> That's probably a silly answer, but. It's a, it's a mashup and someday that, that will yeah. come true. You, yeah, I mean, yeah, you yeah. said it on camera here. It's like, it's, it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. That's, uh, one, go ahead, Levering. Um, I think this is probably the best uh, connection I've ever made. I just did the Newark Independent Film Festival, and it was sponsored by Rutgers and Prudential nice. at the Haynes Building, which is owned by um, Prudential now and Rutgers. They've now taken over all that. Teacher's Village. Wow. I don't know if you know about the, the Newark It's a North Campus, yeah. Yes, yeah. it's the Newark portion. Um, so when you said the film festival, mm -hmm. it was the Newark Independent Film Festival. We had the cast of Greenleaf. We had the, all, mostly all of was there. And they were doing branding and encouraging children to find their niche. Mm -hmm. And we did improv. We did a whole section with the kids with the improv. And it's so funny, I, I had no clue who you were. I'm a lead worker. Uh, just finished working on a film with um, LBJ is almost his son. I'm 58, but I, I have a PhD in mathematics, but I did, I have done everything mm -hmm. under the sun, but ended up in CSR. And I encourage my kids that it's mandatory that they do do something, mm -hmm. which is an organization that does philanthropic work for young people. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about them, but uh, that's all they do is they find causes and then find a niche within that community and but through social media. Mm -hmm. So they will save animals, do dog right. walking, dog washing, they will do mouse swabbing, they will do anything. And so I think this is actually excellent because I think what happens with children, students, is they go into college, out of high school, and they have to have a goal in mind. And I always tell them, if you want to get a scholarship, don't even say what your degree is going to be because you're open for everything. The first mm -hmm. two years, you don't have to clear anything. So you can apply for every scholarship and then figure it out along the way. Spike Lee did. He figured it out when he was about to get kicked out of college that I better find, figure out something or else I'm not going to be here. And I think the fact of encouraging students to do more philanthropic work, you can find your niche, you can find your passion and then you can undergird it with a degree because a degree is nothing. I'm 58, IBM used to hire people because you learn how to think 
and they taught you to play it. So mm -hmm. I think this is excellent. If you were to bring it to a more diverse colleges and to where the kids are like, I don't have to say I got, I got to be this. No, just get out there, get your gen eds done. And in the meantime, volunteer everywhere. Go to the dorm shelter, go do this. You know, go to the veterans parade and, and hand out, go to St. Jude's and, and clean up. Experience just, and meet people. Right, mm -hmm. and yep. that's when you find your aha, which is your niche. You, you need to be up here. Like, right <laughs> There's, we need some people, we need to talk after this, and I think, yeah. Um, any comment to that? I mean, that was. No, but I find it I hope you got that, Matt. No, I, I love like that. I did. I, my brothers, I wanted to hang around my brothers, and the only way I could go outside, I was a little sister, was to hang out with them, so I had to be tough. I was a tomboy all my life. So I started, they were wrestlers, so I was a statistician down there in that, and I learned mm -hmm. everything they did. And I went to the football, wherever they went, mm -hmm. I went, because I wanted just to be in. And play scully and, you know. Well, you seem super happy. So oh, yeah. if if that's me when I'm 58, looking <laughs> looking like you're 30, then <laughs> damn girl, I, love, I hope that's the case. I love your answer to him, which was like you had it already planned. Like I'm setting the stage. This is what I want. I will hire myself. I will start. I will have a producer. It was an excellent. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for those kind words. <laughs> The last question, it kind of goes off of these last two, this is it, and then and obviously we can mingle here. And I, I think back in June we connected, you, you guys were hiring. What, what are you, be it corporate social responsibility or HBO or another industry, September 2017, what skills are you hiring for right now? What do you think students need to come out of college with? Um, I think they, in CSR or it just in general? Just, just in general. Coming out of college, take the, the degree away. I think that I think <laughs> I think that students need to be comfortable having a conversation with a complete stranger about a topic they know nothing about. Like I think that, because I, when I was coming out of college, that was intimidating, that's intimidating. I think, I, I mean, I know that's really general, but I mean, I can say, you know, technology is completely the future and, you know, linear TV is not, you know, going to exist anymore. And I think that everybody should really be tapped into that, but um, that, I don't think that speaks to everybody. So um, I think they need to be willing to have a really uncomfortable conversation um, and, you know, step up to the plate and not, and don't like shy away, like, I don't know. That's my advice. Step up to the plate and have that uncomfortable conversation. That last minute is going to be a great clip here. I, I, that's, that's why I think you're here today, because of those uncomfortable situations and conversations and people you've met. So, like right now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, again, thank you, Mary. That, that was, this was seriously thank awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, time. everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. I know there's some familiar faces. I've been to a few others and some new faces. But again, uh, please take advantage of chatting with Mary while we uh, wrap up here. And if you want to chat with me, you're more than welcome. This is our last New York City event for 2017. We will be doing a veterans panel in, in DC, uh, probably right around Veterans Day, like late October, early November. And um, the last thing we're going to do this year is we're actually going to flip the script and someone's going to interview me about my first three years as an entrepreneur. And then uh, next year, we're looking to, to kind of take this out of the Mid-Atlantic and do some Nashville, Minneapolis, Northwest uh, areas and kind of bring more conversations like this and free content to people. So uh, by any means, anyway, you guys want to stay connected with the Niche Movement, this whole thing has been recorded and will be on our YouTube channel and website as well as our podcast. And um, anyway, uh, I can connect you to Mary after this or people that you know of. Please shoot me an email at kevin at the niche movement dot com. Um, but thanks again, Mary, and, and thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Thanks, guys.